Gauss's law. Let's write it again. You can never get enough Gauss's law. Let's write it in terms of the flux. The flux through the closed surface will be the charge enclosed over epsilon naught, Gauss's law. So right now, we're just going to think conceptually and visually about Gauss's law. Go through a few problems. Make sure we really believe that Gauss's law is always true, which of course we do, because it would be blasphemy to not believe it's true. So let's start with just a little point charge here, like that. And let's go with a surface that is a nice sphere that's nice and symmetric around the surface. So Gauss's law says that you're going to get a positive flux. You're going to get a flux because Q enclosed is a positive charge over epsilon naught. So let's think if that's really going to happen. Well, if you go to the surface, there's E. If you go here, there's E. If you go here, there's E. And if you thought about dA, it's always parallel. So your dA's and your E's are the same all over the surface. So sure enough, that makes sense. You would believe that this would make sense. If Q were negative, what would happen? Well, we know from Coulomb's law the E's would go in, the flux would be negative, everything makes sense. But Gauss's law doesn't require this charge to sit here. What if we had the charge up here? That's going to change all kinds of stuff if the charge is there charge is there. We can think about the vectors again. Right here, it looks very much the same, except the field will be bigger. So your E might look like that. But your dA would still be there. That'd be good. Down here, your E might be a little bit smaller, because it's farther away. But your dA would still be there. Stranger things would happen at other points. Here, let's see, E would be like that. And your dA, it wouldn't be parallel anymore. It doesn't really matter. You're going to take their dot product. You're still going to get a positive contribution for the flux. Anywhere you go, actually, you'll get an E field. Most places are not going to be parallel to dA, but they're still going to give a positive dot product. So in this case, all these will add up, and it's believable that it would give you a positive number that's Q enclosed over epsilon naught, and it actually is true. If you did the vector calculus problem and calculated that total flux, you'd get Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So if you think in terms of vector fields, it always works. And what I'm trying to point out here, pointing out that it works, but I want you to believe me that when you don't have symmetry, it also works. It's also true. You just have to believe me that if we did that surface integral in vector calculus, we'd get the right answer. There's another way to look at it, which doesn't require, require quite as much believing me. I mean, I hope you do. But you can also do it with field lines, OK? So remember our field lines was just another way to draw the vector field. So there, we had one go up. One go down. Uh, I like to draw eight. Something about drawing eight of them just feels good to me. And we can put little arrow hats, arrow heads on them to remember which way the field goes. Positive charge, the field goes away. The test charge would fly away. So if you look at this, one way you can think of the vector flux is just how many field lines go through. You can basically just count field lines. What's the total flux of the sphere? It's eight field lines. Okay? It's not a good unit for vector flux but it's a way visually just to keep up with it. So the other thing, the number of field lines is proportional to is the charge. Remember when we were drawing these diagrams, we said, how many field lines do you use if you have 2Q and Q? Well, you put twice as many on 2Q as you do on Q. So the number of field lines is proportional to the charge. So you can now see that if eight field lines means a charge of Q, then all eight go out of the sphere, and it's actually anywhere you put it, all eight go out of the sphere. So this way, you can kind of see, as I move this charge around, the flux is always going to be the same. It's always going to be eight field lines coming out. So that might be a more convincing way to look at it. Let's look at a different case, where we have our closed surface. Again, let's make it a sphere. And let's put Q outside the surface. Okay. Think about what the vectors will look like. Well, you get a nice big E field here, because it's close. But dA is going to stick out, because we always put the area vectors out on a closed surface. Uh, out here, you'll have a smaller E field. In that case, it'll be parallel to dA. So this would give you a negative contribution to the flux. This would give you a positive contribution to the flux. And if you add it all up, we'd have to do vector calculus to get it. But you can kind of see, you get a lot of positive. You get a small positive flux over a big area. You get a big negative flux over a small area. And guess what you're going to get? You're going to get that the flux E is going to be 0. Okay? 
if we did the vector calculus, the flux, I promise you, would be zero. And that obeys Gauss's law because there's no charge enclosed. The charge is on the outside, okay? So that is where you believe me about the vector calculus. Now let's do it with field lines. And maybe you won't have to believe me so much. If you don't trust me, it's fine. It's only the third week, I understand. Field lines now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they all go that way. So before I said you think about vector flux with field lines, you just count the lines that go out. And that was positive flux. But here, they go in and out. So if we just count field lines for flux, we have two in, that's negative two, and we have two out, that's positive two. So the total flux is zero. And it has to be zero, right? Because all the field lines from this single charge are just gonna be straight lines. And if a straight line hits a sphere, then it has to, if it goes in, it has to come out. Because it's a straight line and the sphere is finite, right? So no matter what you do, you're always gonna get zero. No matter where you move this around, it might have one line go in, it might have two lines. If you get really close, it might have three lines go in and out. But you're always gonna have the same number go in that come out. So the flux is always gonna be zero. So it's always gonna match Gauss's law because there's no charge enclosed. Okay. These arguments do not rely on it being a symmetric sphere. You could also do it for a cube, okay? So here is a three-dimensional cube. I won't draw the back parts. Let's just imagine we have two Q here, and let's imagine we have minus Q here. Those are inside the cube, okay? We remember how to draw the field lines for that. Oh, well, we had to put more, say we put eight lines on the 2Q and only four lines on the Q. Well, one goes down, this goes to here, and this goes to here, and this one goes like that. And we can draw them all and go crazy. And we could calc, we, we could draw them exact and count the lines going in and out, okay? If we were to do that, what would we get? Phi E, we would get the right answer. We know from Gauss's law it would be 2Q minus Q over epsilon naught, it would be Q over epsilon naught. If we did all the field lines and counted, I can't draw it accurately, but if we did it, we would actually get the answer Q over epsilon naught, which matches Gauss's law, okay? It's the total in char uh, charge enclosed in the volume. You could even do this. What if you put 10 Q out here? Really large charge there, creates a big field. It's gonna really manipulate these lines. Suddenly there's gonna be lines, really strong lines going this way, and these are gonna warp out and go that way. It's all gonna be a big mess of lines everywhere. But if you were to count them, the flux would still be Q over epsilon naught. Because all Gauss's law cares about is the enclosed charge. It doesn't care about this charge out here. It is true, this charge makes field lines, and it makes a field that penetrates the closed surface. But it goes in and it comes out and its flux cancels. It doesn't, it doesn't create any flux inside the closed surface because it's not inside, it's on the outside. So this one basically does this. These two basically do this. The details are a mess, but you can always rely on Gauss's law. Gauss's law is always, always true. So I think that clears up everything except we have one question. Let's see here. Uh, why, wise guy. What if the charge is right on the surface? Yes, what if the charge is right on the surface? Well, that's appropriate uh, name of that person. So let's say, let's you know, just take one, this sphere. Wise guy is asking, what if there's one literally on the surface? Even if it's a point charge. A point charge is infinitely small. A surface's thickness is infinitely thin. So let's just take the infinitely small limit and say it's sitting right there. So what is the flux now? We have Q sitting right on the edge of the surface. Phi E is Q over two epsilon naught. Even when things are infinitely small, if you put them right on an edge, you still think of half of it on one side and half of it on the other side. So there you get half, Q over two epsilon naught. 